can do that, I guess I'll get started. Good to see everybody tonight. Uh, uh, Y'all having a good week? Pretty good. Well, it's good to see everybody. I really enjoyed the class uh, and the spirit and the energy that's in here. The discussion that we've had has, has been excellent and uh, appreciate that. Hope that that will continue. Uh, Yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. I had a joke, but I don't know. <laughs> um, so we're in a discussion of, of tensions and paradoxes uh, in scripture. And tonight, uh, the topic that uh, I have is, is called answering fools and other paradoxes. So uh, when, you know, Brian just kind of opened it up there for me uh, to, to do others, so I guess I can go with whatever I want. But I, I actually think we'll probably exhaust our time just on uh, the question of, of answering fools. And uh, if not, I do have a few others that we can we can look at, and we'll do so if, if need be. But uh, depending on how uh, talkative you guys are tonight, we'll determine how far we uh, go beyond that particular paradox. Uh, this paradox, uh, answering fools, is, is based on um, Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5. Uh, verse 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. And verse 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Now, um, this one's a little bit nuanced and difficult, but can you, do you, do you sense the tension <laughs> here? Um, it's really amazing. Uh, any number of times uh, in, in reading different pieces uh, of writing that uh, in atheist arguments of, against, against Christianity, one of which is that you commonly hear is the Bible is full of contradictions, and that one of the places that is frequently cited is Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. As just like, see, I mean, it's just hopelessly full of contradictions. As if the writer of Proverbs didn't notice. Uh, in verse 4, I said this, and then in the next verse, you know, I, I said the opposite. Um, you know, it just slipped up on me. I didn't notice that. And uh, that's clearly not the case. It's rather obvious that the writer knows what he's doing and that he has set these two verses um, in juxtaposition, if that's the right use of that word. It's one of those words most people don't know what it means anyway, so uh, it sounds pretty good. In juxtaposition to each other, uh, just like that, obviously for a reason. And I think the reason uh, will become more clear as we, as we go through it. It certainly makes you stop and think, well, what does he say? Why does he say, seem to say the opposite uh, from one verse to the next? And I think it is the intention of Proverbs to make us uh, face those kinds of things and, and these dilemmas, uh, these conundrums and, and problems. Um, and we'll get into that in to tonight's lesson. So before we... Uh, before we begin, um, who wants to lead us in a word prayer tonight? Kyle, you're, you're up. I'll do it. Thanks. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. <coughs> so, um, obviously this statement's found in the book of Proverbs, and the book of Proverbs is a unique section of the Bible, uh, what we call wisdom literature. We'll talk about wisdom in just a moment. but. Most of us are familiar with these kinds of definitions. It's from the Hebrew word masal, or however you pronounce that, I don't know. But uh, it, a proverb is typically a, a vivid, terse, or a very brief, poetic, thought-provoking saying. And uh, uh, one author describes them as sayings that contain a maximum of meaning and a minimum of words which is a pretty clever way of stating what a proverb is. So that's kind of the nature of, of proverbs. They're intended to grab our attention. They're intended to be vivid. They're intended to be memorable. 
And uh, of course, the way that these two proverbs are laid out next to each other certainly accomplishes that. It grabs your attention, it's briefly stated, uh, and um, fulfills the, the, the thing that we have in mind when we talk about a proverb. Now, it, it's contained in what we call the wisdom literature um, of, the, of the Bible. Uh, before we get into that, though, let's say a few more things about proverbs. Proverbs can seem rather simplistic at times. Um, you can read the book as if it's just sort of random truisms that uh, are just you know, good advice. Uh, change your oil every three to 5,000 miles. Um, things things of, this, uh, of this sort. Um, but it's much deeper than that. And the more you read it and the more you see the whole book laid out the way it is, the, the, uh, the deeper you see the purpose behind it, how, how it does cause you, if you're a careful reader, to stop and ponder and think about the significance of what each of the Proverbs and then what all of them put together are saying. Uh, they are not absolute promises. They contain promises often and they contain commands, but they're not, they're not like law. It's not like the Ten Commandments, thou you know, shalt not uh, uh, murder. And, and it's not laid out in commandments like that, but there are things that it tells you you should do and things that it tells you that you, you should not do. And often associated with those uh, are promises. And the, yet it's, it's um, phrased in ways that are, are quite different than what we think of as, as law in Scripture or absolute uh, promises. They are often described as general truths and they are usually partial in nature. And by that I mean that you can't take just one proverb by itself and understand it to uh, be the explanation of everything. You have to take them and lay alongside them subsequent proverbs on the same subject in order to get a complete picture uh, of, of, what, of, of the situation with regard to that subject. <clears throat> and of course we do that generally in life, but I think it's especially that way in the book of, of Proverbs. And that kind of comes to a head here in Proverbs 26, 4 and 5, where one half of this commandment or this uh, statement of what you ought to do, um, um, answer a fool or don't answer a fool, you need both of these to really get the full picture of what you ought to do when you encounter someone speaking foolishly, saying foolish things. Uh, you should answer them, and on some occasions and under certain circumstances, you should avoid answering them at all costs. And only when you put both of those partial truths together do you get a full sense of the wisdom that is necessary to, to live your life uh, as, as God would want you to. Now, the Proverbs are contained within a section of Scripture that we know of as wisdom literature, primarily Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. You might include a few other books like Job, for instance, uh, with that in some way. But the Hebrew word for wisdom is hokmah, which includes being moral, a moral and ethical person, but it addresses more than just uh, morality as we typically think of it. It addresses how to handle situations where there is no explicit moral law telling you what to do. Um, again, the, the Ten Commandments, for instance, there, there's you know, do not worship idols. Do not, do not carve out for yourselves representations of, of God and bow down to them. And it's never a good idea to do that under any circumstance. But Proverbs comes in uh, underneath that and while it's not laying down those kinds of laws it is telling us how to well put it this way the Ten Commandments think that that's just like blunt force law okay this is just um, brutal truth okay and then there is there's there's finesse in life and, and really in life you need both of these don't you you, you need some things that are just laid down this 
This is the law. Lay it down the law. Don't make idols for yourself and bow down to them. Don't murder people. Don't commit adultery. These kinds of, of things. And then you're going to encounter a whole host of situations in your daily life that don't neatly fall under those kinds of laws that you, you need some finesse in order to, to make. What do you do when your son comes home with a black eye at the door? Okay, now, now what do I do? Okay, uh, I, I can't find a commandment that tells me what to do when Junior comes home with a black eye and uh, I need to kind of have some idea about that. Or what, what do you do when you're borrowing your neighbor's lawnmower and it breaks down? You know, what, what, what do I do now? So there's all these kinds of uh, wisdom issues that we need help with to think uh, as God would have us to think. And that's where the wisdom literature really, really comes in well. Um, things like, you know, who am I going to marry? What should I major in? Should I move or stay? Or should I post this on social media? Or should I delete it? Um, and that's going to be a big one in our discussion tonight. Um, questions about our personality and the way we present ourselves to others. Am I too reserved or too forward? Am I too disorganized or am I OCD about organization? Am I too stingy or am I too wasteful with my money? And uh, one of the places where we see this kind of wisdom displayed uh, is in the blank. Uh, blatant paradox uh, of, of Proverbs 26. So that, that puts us back to our text where we're going to focus on this paradox or tension tonight. So uh, again, just read both of those and think about it on your own for just a second. I'd like for you to just try to absorb what that says. Can everyone see that? Okay. As you read that, certain questions, certain ideas, maybe certain people, maybe certain situations that you have in the past or maybe even currently are, are dealing with begin to surface and, and, and come to mind. Um, one of the things that is obviously important to understanding and applying this proverb is the question of, well, well what is a fool? And I think in Proverbs and in the Bible in general, a, a fool is a person who's habitually out of touch with reality. Um, <laughs> do what? Ignorant. Ignorant. Yeah. Ignorant is the way we used to say. Okay. As opposed to stupid, it's just somebody who's, who's ignorant. Um, blatantly out of touch with reality uh, in such a way that they make life miserable for themselves and for anybody else who has the unfortunate uh, circumstance to, to be connected with them or rely upon them in some important way. Uh, fools are blind to the structure of reality, whether it be physical, um, relational, psychological, economical, uh, or spiritual. Uh, the, the way that God has set up and arranged reality, they keep bumping into it and wondering why it is that they wake up every morning with bruises all over themselves and seem unable to learn from their mistakes. So that's sort of a broad general description, I think, of, of the fool. Uh, but there are also within um, the book of Proverbs sort of some breakdowns of subsets of fools. So we've got different kinds of fools, and we're going to get into that in just a moment as we try to answer this question. But looking at the two, how, how would some of you just off the top of your head, looking at that, say we deal with this paradox or this tension? Should you ever, or under what circumstances should you, what, what's, what's, he, what's he up to? Yes. I, as a mom, I just immediately, I think of my kids. I'm not saying they're fools, I'm just saying. They're foolish. They're ignorant, right. They right. haven't yet learned. And so if you respond to that foolishness escalating with emotions, like, you know, they're throwing a fit and then you get mad or raise your voice, that's just going to make the problem worse. Okay. So you answer, you address the problem, the foolishness, and 
so that they know that that's not an appropriate behavior okay. in a wise way. Okay, very good. So in that sense, you, you, you are answering the fool, but you're not doing so according to their folly. You're, you're, you're not getting down on their level to uh, deal with the situation. Um, although, again, sometimes as a parent, you're like, okay, I really, need to, uh, I really need to answer them according to their folly so that they, in my response, can see exactly how ridiculous what they're doing looks like. You ever, any parents ever done that? Uh, don't, don't, don't roll your eyes at me. You, you, know, uh, you try to use a, a voice, uh, you know, whining, crying voice the same way that they do, that all of a sudden they're like, oh, I really do sound like you know, terrible when I, when I talk like that. So in that sense, you're, you're doing exactly what they did in order to help them not be so foolish in their own eyes, not to, to think that that kind of thing is, is okay. Now, now they can see. I think we start out wanting the second one to help someone, but it ends up in sometimes a hubristic disparagement where neither of you get anywhere, and it ends up, you know, you yourself are just like them. You're just arguing about it, you're not changing any mind. Or very good. So you enter into it with the, with the best of intentions. You're really wanting to help them open their eyes to something. But you get drawn into the back and forth, and the next thing you know, you, you're, you're, both, you're both fools. You're both idiots. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I feel like part of the point with these verses is also just that if someone has made up their mind about a foolish decision, there is not a way to win. Because if you do try and like take the high road, then they're gonna be like, well, I, I win, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Or if you get down on their level, and they're gonna be like, oh, well, you're saying I'm doing something wrong, and you're doing the same thing. So I guess we're, you know, if I'm a fool, then you're a fool. <laughs> it's like, there's no yes. way to win in a situation like it's that. It's interesting you say that, because uh, several commentaries that I, I looked at, the, the, the writers made mention of the fact that they think part of what the writer is doing here is just pointing out the, the impossibility of life sometimes, that there's just no win circumstances because exactly the reasons that you point out and that it's, when you when you put it there like that, you, you kind of realize, yeah, <laughs> when someone's acting a fool, you really can't do much. That's just to say that's an interesting way to look at it. Never thought about it. That's before. right, is that? <laughs> well, thank you for sharing, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, based off of what she was saying, that it could be something as simple as like, maybe don't spend time around fools because there's, you're never going to win. Like there's phrases like that in English, American language when we say like, can't live with them, can't live without them. If somebody were to look at that in 200 years in a different yeah. language, they might be like, that's a paradox. You can't say that. But we all know what that means. Yes. It, it may be a lot more of a colloquial thing from that okay. time. Very good. Yeah, I uh, hadn't, hadn't actually thought of that, but I think that's very, very true. It could very well be the case. Uh, and, and I like what, what you said, too, about the, re the realization that this is a no-win situation means, for one thing, I really need to minimize my exposure to fools as, as, as much as possible <laughs> because I'm not going to win when I... Some of you are like, yeah, I can't wait till I retire. <laughs> I can't wait till the kids are gone. I can minimize my exposure. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> well, so what are some factors that we should consider in whether we're going to respond to a fool or not? And Brian mentioned uh, in putting together the schedule that whoever covered this might consider uh, specifically I don't want to limit it to this, but maybe just this one thing to kind of run in the back of our minds is our um, use of social media. How, how many of you guys are um, relatively active on social media? You, in other words, you're at least, let's say, three or four times a week, you're on social media and you're not just posting things, but maybe you're interacting with the posts that other people make. Uh, what percentage of us do that? I, I don't. Okay, so it's 
close to half, I guess. Okay. So um, um, I've got a story. Should I tell the story now or at the end? Or at the end, you might not get to hear the story. You may run out of time. I used to. Uh, does it, do any of y'all remember video nets? Okay. Yeah, Cleo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Of course. This I didn't have it. Cleo Oh yeah. Cleo Nats. Yeah. It, I, does it still exist? I don't know. Okay. This was like way, way back, 15, 20 years ago, something like that. Very early, and I think. Uh, was it Ken and Blue or, or somebody that started that? I don't know. But it was, a, it was a social media platform that was mostly made up of members of Churches of Christ in different places. And I got on, on there and, uh, man, I went to, went to town and, and interacting with people and, uh, you know, answering a lot of fools, a lot of fools answering this fool and, and back and forth. And... There was, um, somehow, I don't, I don't think I originated it, but somebody brought up the, the question of iridology. Now, I don't even want to, if you don't know what iridology is, then good for you. If you do, and you're a big believer, then please don't take offense. But suffice it to say, at least at the time, I, I, was, I was not well inclined toward the idea of iridology. So I made my feelings about that quite well known, in fact, made some statements that were pretty um, harsh, I would say, about anybody who would see an iridologist or make use of that. And unbeknownst to me, and I wouldn't have said what I had said had I known that there were people who were reasonably close to me, other Christians, uh, whose family member was seeing an iridologist who had terminal cancer. It was kind of like, we don't have any other hope, and you know maybe, maybe something will come from this. And they were very, very badly hurt by the fact that the preacher had said the things that he said about iridology. So it really shook me a, a lot, and pretty much that's when I just shuck being, I still sometimes uh, stalk people on, <laughs> on uh, even that, not very much, because I'd rather just have high opinions of all of you rather than know what you actually think about stuff. So I, I very rarely do that, but um, there, are, there are certain people that I follow on Twitter and things like that to <clears throat> read what their think, thinking is. But um, pretty much just put it away because I, I felt for me personally from that experience, maybe this isn't something that I handle very well. I think at this point in life, I, I, I thought about getting back in because I think I could do better. Uh, and I've learned something from that experience. But um, I think all of us also who have been involved with much could recount whether it's something like that, something similar where you really regret things that you've said or you realize you got into an argument or a discussion online with people that just went nowhere and was counterproductive um, and you know, wish you could, you could pull all of that back. So maybe keeping that as something operating in the back of your mind as we, as we think about this. But I, I thought of today about six different things that would help me and maybe all of us as we try to decide whether we're gonna answer a fool or whether we're gonna not answer a fool and if so, how we should go about it. Uh, the first question, and most of these are our questions is who is saying who is the fool who's saying this that I now am in a position to decide to engage or walk away from and one of the questions that that raises is what kind of fool um, are they uh, if, if you're dealing with your children that's one kind of naivete we might would say rather than foolishness but that's actually categorized in Proverbs as, as one kind of fool versus other kinds of fools. There's, there's fools in Proverbs. Just look at chapter 1, uh, Proverbs 1. I didn't put all these up on the screen. Proverbs 1, 22. This is Lady Wisdom calling out in the street, and she asks, How long, O oh, simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers 
delight in their scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. So it seems that in that verse, there are at least three different kinds of what we're lumping together in our discussion as, as fools. There's simple ones, there's scoffers, and there's fools. And she has questions for them as to how long they're going to remain in that status before they begin to listen to what she has to say. So one of the questions that I need to ask before engaging or not engaging with a person is what kind of, what kind of fool are they? Are they the simple who are gullible and naive and inexperienced? Uh, the kind of person maybe that's easily taken in by personalities and ideologies and could poten potentially really be helped by me engaging with them. That they're not like hardened fools. They're, they're not scoffers as we'll come to in a moment. They just don't know and, and they seem to have fallen into uh, a behavior or a way of thinking that is, is not healthy, not godly, not good for them. Uh, well, maybe I would want to answer that kind of fool and do whatever I can to try to provide them some direction and instruction and help out of that. Would that make sense? Yeah. Uh, then there's the uh, scoffer who is the person who is very prideful who perhaps hates authority in general, uh, wants to debunk everything and do so quite smugly in the, in, in the process. Uh, and the question is, okay, now if I engage this kind of person, uh, what is likely to be the outcome of, of that? It's a totally different situation than the, than the simple, isn't it? Um, and then, though not mentioned here, explicitly in verse 22 there is another category of the foolish person found in chapter 6 verses 12 through 15 i want to look at 6 verses 12 through 15 where the esv describes them as a worthless person uh, and a wicked man he says a worthless person a wicked man goes about with crooked speech winks with his eyes and sickles with his feet points with his finger with perverted heart devises evil continually sowing discord therefore calamity will come upon him suddenly in the moment he will be broken beyond healing so uh, this this is a whole nother level isn't it so we've, we've got the the uneducated person the, the naive maybe the young person uh you, you've then got the person who's a mocker and a scoffer who likes to make fun of of things and look sophisticated and then you have the downright evil person who actually has malignant intentions thinks about ways to do and say things that they are calculating to do maximum damage with um, and proverbs really frequently and in other wisdom literature would call us to absolutely avoid contact with this kind of person uh, as much as you possibly can. And to try to answer this person, uh, you're simply looking for trouble, right? So that might be one way to, to go about trying to dis determine in this paradox which way to, to lean. Do I answer? Do I not answer? Well, what kind of fool is it that I'm dealing with? And then uh, a second one, there's the five types there. Um, what, what is strategically best? Uh, how does this help my cause? And by my cause here, I, I have in mind the, the cause of, of a Christian to, to glorify God, to, to uh, do good in the world. Um, and does engaging with this person in this circumstance uh, promote my interest personally and the, the cause that I'm trying to represent as a Christian. Um, look at, again, chapter, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 17 this time. <laughs> yeah. He 
says, whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. Okay. Now there's a great proverb. Okay. Uh, there's a, a big old dog going down the road and I just, you know, I can't, I can't let it pass. I, I, I just can't leave it alone. I'm run out there and grab this thing by the ears. And, and you, I suppose you could do that if you got a good, good strong grip. You get a hold of that guy by the ears and you've really, you've really got it. But what's the problem? You gotta let go sooner or later. Okay? And when you let go, he's, he's gonna have his, his response, isn't he? Um, and it was totally unnecessary because this, this dog was you know, kind of minding his own business before you came along and grabbed him by the ears. So it, it wasn't really in my best interest. This doesn't strategically help me in any way. It doesn't promote the cause that I'm, I'm about as a, as a Christian. So uh, that's a, a good question. Then also I think thinking about how have they already by speaking that I'm going to respond to, have they already kind of framed the discussion? And it may be that Entering into this discussion as it's already been framed, as we've talked about already, it's kind of a no-win. Uh, why go in there when they've already set the terms of the debate, as it were, in such a way that I, I really can't gain ground anyhow? Um, you know, that's what I mean by strategically applying wisdom to this. It's like, yeah, that would, it would really be good to say something about that, but I don't even know where to how to engage that productively. Probably be better off just to leave this alone. Another question on that to me is, uh, in connection with this, is uh, who's the audience? Is it just this person? Uh, are there other people, like on social media, likely listening in, watching? And if so, how is it not only gonna affect the person I'm engaging with, but those who are the innocent bystanders. <clears throat> Thirdly, what is my exit strategy? And maybe I should have put the passing dog by the ears uh, proverb with this, but um, before you engage in something, it's a really good idea to think about how you're going to disengage from it. Um, um, I'm sitting here right now thinking about whether to engage in something or not. It's like, <laughs> you know, whenever there's the potential for a war, everybody, everybody gets fired up and, man, we're ready. We're ready to go to war. We're ready to show whoever it is on the other side how the cow eats the, the cabbage. As they uh, said that. You never heard that. <laughs> um, and that's from Texas. So we're going to show them how the cow eats the cabbage. And... Um, the next thing you know, I'm not trying to be, to, you may believe completely opposite of this, you were 20 years in Afghanistan and there's no way to get out and when you do it's ugly as all get out. And um, I say that as someone who 20 years ago was all ready to go, let's, let's go, let's go. And um, that's in a, a, a war of, you know, a real war. But the same thing ought to be thought of when we're talking about engaging in a war of ideas or a war of words with somebody. Is this a 30 second engagement, a 30 minute, a 30 month or a 30 year thing that I'm about to, to, to tie into? And that's, I think, a, a really good question. How am I going to get out of this once I get into it? Yeah. I did notice, uh, because I got an email that told me I had a mention in Facebook about the songs, the, the anthems, you know. So, uh, good, good. Um, and I've got one for you tonight. Uh, it's Kenny Rogers. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. So, uh, yeah, what, what strategically is best and what is my exit strategy if I do engage in this? Uh, fourth one, and this is, to me, getting to the really important stuff. Do I have the self-mastery to not become a fool 
myself. All right? Have you ever have you ever seen somebody that you really respect answer a fool? And before this goes to the comments you've already made, before it was over, the person that you respected has become so drawn in and were so defined by the terms that the other person set for the discussion that they look just as 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 ugly and dirty and dishonorable as the fool that they were trying to correct. Um, and before I jump into an engagement with another person, I think this is really, really important. Can I do this without it soiling my soul, soiling my heart, changing my speech such that I'm going to make the cause that I Try, and trying to represent look, uh, look foolish as well. Um, my mentor, um, D. Bowman, when I was working with him, he, he was under uh, such as the things. And I remember asking him why he didn't respond <laughs> to what these people were saying, because it's like, this isn't even true. And, and uh, uh, his response was, you can't kick a skunk without getting stink all over it. <laughs> um, you probably did hear that one. Yeah, okay. Um, you can't kick a skunk without getting stink all over you. You know, in, in worse than just getting their stink on you, you become a skunk yourself because you're, you're so drawn into the discussion that it, it stains who you, your own character. One of the things I love, uh, we've mentioned a number of times in here because of his love of paradox is G.K. Chesterton. One of the things about him that was really interesting is uh, he, he was involved in lots of, of, of debates, you know, uh, national and international <coughs> debates. Uh, um, and I don't just mean like formal stand-up debates, but back and forth written exchanges and extended controversies with people of various sorts, but almost, I, I think, without exception, he was um, loved by his opponents because he could engage with them in a serious discussion and poke fun and have fun with it, uh, but remain, um, but, but not be destroyed in his own character by the, by the engagement that he had with the other side. That's a really rare quality, but it's a question we've all got to ask ourselves when we're wondering, do I answer this fool or not? I think it's, I'm going to say something that maybe some people don't agree with, but as Christians, I don't think any public situation, including social media, is the right platform to argue the points. Because at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're allowing an open forum for a lot of people who don't agree with you to come back and one, make you look like a fool. Um, and two, you are... Um, potentially making other Christians look foolish because someone will see your response and say, well, if that's what a Christian is, you know. So I think we've got to be really careful about when it comes to issues of morality, especially like behind that little keyboard, just yeah. clack it away and putting a response out there because it really does reflect on all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ, not just on you. So I think that's something we have to be really, really careful of. Very, very good point. I will say on on a tying economic with yours. I think many of us, and I put myself at the top of the list here, you know, struggle with this mm -hmm. and often have become engaged in things where we probably don't have the self control not to get drawn into much more heated and, and recognizing that, well, there are a few people who really have this gift. Yes. G.K. Chesterton, you mentioned in our day and time, John Lennox is someone who is just a model citizen and Christian in terms of engaging people publicly. But I think I'm not nearly like that, and I think many of us are not. Very, very good point there. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a rare quality, and I think people who we all so quickly just get wrapped up and we wrap our identity into this point of discussion and we get what they call <coughs> vocalism where it's like this issue 
even though 15 minutes ago it didn't matter that much to me, is now the most important thing in the world. And, and uh, my successfully refuting this other person's point uh, has my identity completely wrapped up in it. And, and yeah, here we go. And we've become very defensive. So yeah, next, the next one, kind of derivative of that, is what are my intentions? Uh, am I striving to be a peacemaker in this, Matthew 5, 9, or a troublemaker? Proverbs 26, uh, 20 and 21, which says this, For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisper, quarreling ceases. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to a fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. So it's like, um, am I answering the fool because I'm afraid if I don't say something, everybody's just going to forget about this and it's going to go away. And I don't want it to go away, so I'm going to add fuel to the fire. Or uh, am I answering it as, as a desire to be someone who can calm down the flames before it becomes a, a raging forest fire? So I'll tell you, I deleted my Facebook years ago. I deleted Instagram. I got too drawn into political discussions, this and that. But my, and I, I, I understood the negative impact it was having on my life. You know, I would relate, if I had to choose which fool I was, it would be the scoffer, right? Um, and I uh, did not want it to impact my um Christianity like that. However, that being said, I do feel like our culture is extremely susceptible to this invisible war of information where the people that whose stances are popularized and are the loudest are the ones that prevail and we see the impact that that has on our culture as homosexuality has clearly been not only accepted but lauded and celebrated because there's so much online about how amazing this is. And now we're seeing it with, you know, trans issues, this and that. And I almost feel like if we are quiet, then they win. Like the people that push these immoral issues in our society and culture, they win because they are the loudest. And, and because you have so many fools out there that are so clueless and they don't know how to think for themselves, that if somebody's not helping them point them in the right direction, then they're just going to go with what the crowd is doing. Does that make sense? So how do you, yeah. how do you justify all of that? Yeah. Well, that's a, a, a tough thing. I think, again, that comes back a little bit to how the debate is framed in the first place. And too often, I do think Christians, in responding to uh, issues like homosexuality and transgenderism, uh, come to it in a way that makes them end up looking like just the you know the screeches uh, rather than someone who has uh, the context to make uh, you know like, it's like someone I think Wendy I think it was you saying you know trying to settle these things on social media itself is like almost the worst way to engage in this um, but that isn't to say that there aren't people who have this really unique ability to come in themselves and frame a discussion in such a way that caused people to think, oh, well, I hadn't really considered it like that before, rather than just, uh, yeah, 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 well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, and I can see if you can find a way to um, either personalize it or make it more private, because, um, I don't know. I, I think that you also can um, hinder your witness to people if you put these like statements about things out there because then who's going to want to reach out to you if they're that person? You know, you can't, you can't, you no longer can reach those people because you've made such a strong statement against what they're doing. Yeah, it's a difficult, it's a difficult media to, to have you know, personal, build personal relationships. And I think that's you know, just a societal problem at, at large with social media that we're trying to figure out a way to overcome, right? Um, 
Very good. The last one I'll just put up real quickly is just a question. If, if it is a person that you know, do I have a fruitful or fruitless history of engagement with this person? And if <laughs> consistently it doesn't end well, then I probably should not start it up again. Okay. Thank you, guys. <laughs>